Hello, everybody. Wayne Butterfield from ISG, uh, Director of uh, Intelligent Automation uh, and Global Lead for Contact Center and Artificial Intelligence over at, uh, at ISG. Uh, I'm joined here today by PV Cannon, uh, CEO of 247.ai uh, and also author of The Age of Intent. So, PV, hi. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks for having me. Um, I know when we spoke last, we were talking about some of the fantastic insights that you uh, you have with regards to what is changing with your client base as a result of COVID. So I don't know that you can give us some information and, and, and dig into a little bit of that. Yeah, I think, you know, COVID has been, uh, you know, a trigger for a lot of changes. So, you know, I'll cover it in a few different sections. The first one is obviously a big mindset change, right? Traditionally, Contact centers is all about the teams being together. There is a supervisor that you know closely works with a team of uh, agents, and so it's all about physical presence. Everything, every process is designed for you know in-person presence uh, for the work to be executed, right? And then fundamentally, you remove everything, right? The agents disappear into their homes. The supervisor is now uh, virtual, and then all the processes. When you think about it, whether it's quality assurance, listening in giving coaching, guidance, everything had to be in a kind of rethought fairly quickly, right? So that's on just the process side. From a client perspective, it's even a bigger shift, right? A number of clients, you know, you know work from home for agents is not a new concept, right? Uh, around the time offshoring started, work from home started as well in many of the geographies, right? But it was kind of somehow boxed into this niche application which is, you know, we'll use it for pizza ordering because you have spiky orders and people can work from home and so on and so forth. And so the mainstream contact center applications were never thought suitable to work from home, right? And even during the COVID crisis, we had certain clients in telco, banking, refusing to allow agents to work from home, right? Uh, meanwhile, some other banks and some other telcos, you know, relaxed and said, hey, this is what it is. We have no certainty when agents are going to come back to the center and we're talking about, you know, 80, 90% of the agent capacity just disappearing. Right. Uh, so that forced uh, clients to rethink uh, about this new paradigm. And what was not, not surprisingly within a month after things settled down, pretty much every client came to us and said, let's always have, you know, 25% to a third of our workforce in this new paradigm. Right. Coming back to the, you know, the operation side of things, uh, you know, uh, one of the big concerns on work from home is, can the work be effectively done? And how much does supervision, uh, you know, affect the outcome of the call center agent, right? And not surprisingly, you know, you know, I'm not a traditionalist in this, you know, I believe that people do their work best when they're not closely monitored. And so what we saw was actually an uptick in not only productivity, but in you know, every other aspect you'd expect, quality, patience, you know, name any attribute you want from the agent, thoughtfulness, everything actually shot up because I think it took away the stress of seeing someone walking around or sitting next to you and listening to the you know, um, you know, supervisor. The other thing we saw, again, not surprisingly, is a good interaction among agents to go figure out things uh, you know, because we enabled virtual uh, chat tools and things like that for agents. And, supervisors to connect. So very good adoption there. Agents really loved it. Uh, we have agents, you know, from the US to, you know, Philippines to Latin America to, you know, India. Uh, you know, not every person could work from home effectively, right? Because, you know, the agent homes are not large. They don't have a separate room. So what we saw was many of the agents came to us and said, I'm finding it difficult to do phone calls uh, from my home. You know, can we talk to the client and switch to messaging, right? The third leg, which is the consumer, we saw consumers flock online, mainly because you know, no one could get hold of an agent. Uh, pretty much every company turned on this message that says wait time is going to be super long. It's going to take several hours for you to get to an agent. So we saw adoption of self-service tools go to record highs. And I'll give you some stats. Uh, day one, it's uh, spiked up 10x in most of our clients, right? So people spend a lot more time on the web. A lot more content was read. Uh, and so, which were things which also tell you that if it is easy to talk, and, and I'm not advocating make it difficult to talk to your customers, but people do, you know, when they need something done, they go figure it out, right? 
So self-service rates did shoot up. And I think in, it led to, for some customers, for the first time, they probably discovered that some of the brands that they work with have actually decent self-service capabilities that have been built, built up, right? Um, it's, it's, it's almost like by industry, there's a behavior that's been built into the customer, mainly by the brands. It's not like consumers decide one way or the other, right? Uh, consumers, by definition, flock to digital first. And if they can't quickly figure out something, then they pick up the phone if that's the only option, right? But it's easy to message the brand or chat with them, then they do try it and they stick with it, right? So we saw a big behavior shift in all of that. And what was fascinating is as more customers said, you know, hey, let's go ahead, go ahead and enable the chat and messaging channel, encourage people to go there. We saw about, you know, big sh- for the first time, a big shift from digital being 5 to 10% to, you know, 40, 50, 60% for a lot of the brands, right? And interestingly, Wayne, what happened is, you know, now a lot of our centers are back into operations uh, and agents are coming back to work at, you know, although at a limited capacity, like 50% capacity because of safe distancing and all that. Uh, and as voice, uh, wo- you know, uh, you know, capacity is being built up, there's no demand. So in a, in a way, demand has permanently shifted to digital for those brands who actually m- made that big leap, right? A lot of the brands still, you know, had traditional views. They said, oh, our customers like to talk to us. So, you know, they held on to those views and they couldn't serve their customers, right? So I'd say, you know, if you look at whether from an operation perspective, it was eye-opening. A lot of the myths around, you know, how a call center should be run got busted. From a consumer standpoint, you know, they, you know, got to discover that brands can be flexible and will move to the channels they prefer to deal with. I think for companies overall, I would say 100% of our clients agreed that, I mean, no one got was prepared for this, right? No, you know, national government was prepared for this. No company was prepared for this. No consultancies uh, were prepared for it. It's not like anyone said, you know, hey, there will be a day when we need to be prepared for this, right? All the uh, BCP, uh, you know, plans only involved one country going out of, you know, capacity or one city or so and so on and so forth. And everyone had a BCP plan where 10, 20% of your capacity gets shut, right? What happened was 100% got shut, uh, you know, within a matter of days around the globe. I've got so many questions on the back of that. I mean, it's fantastic to see that level of insight. Um, I guess one of the key things that you're able to, uh, to bring to the table is that that unique role that you play in not only being able to provide a technology platform, um, but you're also a service provider. And then you also have that additional view of your, of your having your own agents and, and how they are experiencing the challenges that have come as a result of COVID. So that was really insightful around the agent KPIs that changed. Um, I must admit that you know, thinking about COVID from the outside in, you know, one of the challenges I've always felt is that um, most of the KPIs are going to go down. So great insight to understand that there are KPIs actually that are, are actually going up as a result of this. And you know, one of the things I've always said within the contact center uh, is that um, you know, a customer can hear the agent smile. So I guess happier agents, in theory, better customer experience. So fantastic insight there. Definitely something I hadn't heard before, and it's great to, to see some data around that. Um, thinking about the enablement from, from office to work and thinking about voice to messaging, tell me a little bit more about how your tech stack is enabling your clients to make this shift. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what helped us was we have, uh, uh, you know, a number of clients who are already doing work from home. Like I said, it was not mainstream, uh, but at the same time, it was not an unknown phenomenon. So what we saw was, uh, uh, you know, those learnings were quickly implemented with other clients. So essentially, you know, uh, we built a bunch of capabilities into the platform that allows secure work from home uh, for agents, as well as all the collaboration capabilities required for agents and supervisors and managers to, you know, get their tasks done. Right. So, for example, from a security perspective, we have built in, uh, you know, capabilities, whether the customer is on the phone or the customer is doing a chat or messaging where, you know, when it comes to payment information, uh, you know, a card is sent to their phone and the customer starts entering the you know, credit card or bank details. And that information is not, you know, uh, you know, seen by the agent. All the agencies is the customer is filling out some information 
And then they get a notification saying, you know, hey, credit card payment processed, now go on to the next step, right? So all these capabilities were built in mainly because we had uh, clients, especially in the travel and hospitality segment that have traditionally adopted work from home, you know, more than anyone else, right? And so that gave us kind of, we were always aware of the insights. What was uh, interesting was to adopt it at mass scale in a very short order of time, right? We're talking about, you know, a small percentage of agents working from home, uh, a few thousand in our platform to suddenly like lift, lifting to, you know, 10X or 15X that population to work from home. So it was a, you know, a, you know interesting experience. Uh, but going back to your comment on happier agents, uh, you know, in most of our locations, our agents commute for at least an hour or more, right? And so uh, the number one feedback we got after week one from work from home is, can we work from home forever? Right? Because, you know, they, they were saving a couple of hours uh, and, you know, no one likes sitting in traffic and, you know, uh, getting to work. Uh, we all know that. So I think that kind of, uh, you know, created a very positive momentum for the agents. You know, obviously they miss the camaraderie. You know, it's traditionally a group of agents that are very outgoing. So they miss all of that. But, you know, we've replaced a lot with the virtual kind of things that we all do now. And of course, now with uh, limited uh, work from office, you know, they are, they are gathering in person, but with safe distance and all of that. Uh, but that's a, that's one aspect. I think there's a lot more research to be done on what is the long-term effects of working from home for a group traditionally that's used to teamwork and that's used to bonding together and that's used to you know socializing together as opposed to other teams. You know, as you know, you know, I, I spent a great deal of time in contact centers, uh, and working from home is just so different. You know, you've got different background noises, there's different distractions, you know, there's bandwidth challenges. Um, and I guess this, this latter point is probably the one of the main challenges for organizations, for customers and for agents. Um, you know, certainly with brands I've engaged with, I've had really long haul times and then there's nothing more frustrating than a call cutting out mid-flow um, after you've waited on hold for 30, 40, 50 minutes. Um, clearly, it's not an ideal scenario for anybody because then you get you know, customers phoning back and, you know, having uh, not a great experience or, or delivering a, a nice message to the agent just because of that sheer frustration. Um, and I guess this is probably one of the reasons why messaging, you know, as a more stable channel is really coming to the fore. Um, obviously, there's the steps that you need to take in order to move the contact center work from home, um, you know, in general, especially those on older legacy. Uh, on-prem, you know, contact center solutions is not necessarily an easy one. You know, it's, it feels like it's a project in itself. Um, uh, you know, how have you been helping clients make that shift? I mean, what are the things that you've had to be thinking about and what clients have had to think about in order to make a shift from old legacy contact center base to, you know, I guess, new world cloud enabled uh, home working. Yes. So I think, you know, the cloud-based uh, solutions definitely give a leg up uh, when it comes to remote access and doing it safely, right? Because safety is already built in as part of the architecture, whereas a lot of the traditional platforms, you like you pointed out, depend on physical security, right? Who can access the floor, who can access the data center, so on and so forth. Uh, in the cloud, that's a moot point because you know you don't have physical access. So, so you know, in a way, those uh, the the architecture difference uh, has you know helped cloud-based architecture, uh, you know, software companies to scale rapidly in this new environment, right? Uh, you know, like I said, there, not every client made it through without struggles. Like you know, there are clients who had struggles scaling their technology to you know uh, you know to work from home. Uh, for instance, there are clients, you know, who didn't have enough licenses for VPNs. So they were like, you know, a lot of things that you don't think about uh, that you suddenly, you know, you need to think about and solve in real time, right? Uh, and then there were, uh, you know, like you take even the contract between 24-7 and our client, it actually says specifically the location, the address, and the floor the work will be done. Uh, because, you know, they, you know, the, these environments are carefully controlled by our clients. And they have uh, remote access to everything, you know, including our security setup, right? 
So, for, you know, so we have to actually rush through before even we can get agents to work from home, change those contracts so that we are legally permitted to, you know, work from home, right? So it's like, you know, flurry of a thousand things that needed to be done, uh, including, you know, procuring mobile broadband. You talked about voice, right? To do a, you know, a good quality voice call, you need about eight megabytes to 10 megabyte capacity, right? So, you know, suddenly all over the world, you know, you know, including the U.S., laptops, the dongles, the broadband, they're all out of, uh, you know, supply, right? And so there was a mad rush to procure those from countries that had it. So there was a, you know, it, it took about a four to six week period before it kind of went into a BAU mode. So it was not, you know, uh, fun for the first four or five weeks. It was fun from a, you know, from a challenge perspective because you're rising up to a challenge and solving it. Uh, but it was a lot of headaches that needed to be uh, cleared. Wayne. I guess once the technology challenges uh, of enabling the agents are over, then I guess you've got the key challenge of, of channel shift. Um, you know, channel shift is absolutely something that's really close to my heart. It's something that I've spent years uh, working on across multiple organizations. Um, and, and it's always been around nudging customers into new channels. It's been around creating visual pointers. It's been around placement of, of buttons, opening new channels, advertising these channels, creating great experiences. You know, little did I know, and I know you would have known, that you know, the real driver to, to get the vast majority of consumers to think about digital as their, their channel of choice uh, would be a, a global pandemic, you know, who would have known? Um, you know, for, for you, I guess the enablement of voice to messaging was an easy one for you to, to help clients with, right? Yep. No, you know, um, you know all along, uh, you know, you're right. I mean, you know, people like you and me have been talking about the desire of consumers to engage with brands digitally, right? Uh, but it, it, you know, what the pandemic proved is the, you know, the mental block was with the brands, not the consumers, right? It's not like, you know, they opened up these channels and no consumer went to it. It was the opposite. Consumers flocked to it, right? And I've always maintained that, you know, digital gets artificially constrained by the amount of agents they put into the system, right? So if you take an average client, let's say they have a thousand agents, if they allocate only 50 people to chat, you know, that means the others who try, you know, either they're told no chat agent is available or you have to wait. And you have to wait for a very long time and people hate waiting, right? It's not like they love digital so much that they're willing to wait for an hour and you can pick up the phone and get someone in three minutes, right? So there was this artificial thing that was always there. You know, we've had uh, the luck of having certain clients who were like, hey, let's keep uh, adding chat agents and decreasing voice agents and see where the natural balance is. And those clients have achieved somewhere like 60% digital, 40%, uh, you know, voice. And so, you know, I think that's kind of the right answer. I think, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, a set of issues that consumers prefer to, you know, handle by voice. And it has nothing to do with age group, interestingly, right? So we find that uh, millennials, when they are understanding financial products, prefer to pick up the phone and talk. Right. And when they are seeking advice, they prefer to talk. Right. Uh, you know, when we are solving complex things like technical support for broadband and computer issues and so on and so forth, you know, all studies shows that if it's going to take more than 10 minutes, you're better off actually getting on a phone call and, you know, helping the customer rather than, you know, chatting back and forth. Not a great experience. Right. Unless, you know, there's remote diagnostic tools that makes the agent take control of the system and then fix it for you, right? So, you know, um, uh, you're right, pandemic really forced everyone to give digital a chance and it worked, no big, no big surprise there. Um, you know, it's a, a great place to end. Uh, and I think that kind of key takeaway, that message is that, you know, what COVID has done is it's given organizations um, and uh, it, it, their customers, this real opportunity to embrace digital channels. Uh, you know, little did we know that it would be a pandemic that would really enable uh, this shift towards digital channels. Um, PV, thank you ever so much for your time. Uh, time is definitely up for this instalment, but we will be back next week. 
So thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Look forward to it.